welcome. We are here um, with the panelists of 20th Century French Republic and Rights Issues. Um, I'm Emma Kuby. I'm an Associate Professor of History at Northern Illinois University, and I'm here to host and moderate um, among these, uh, these panelists whose, um, whose papers you've probably already watched um, some really fascinating work. Um, so uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Lim. Uh, my name is Michael Seidman. I'm a professor <laughs> in history uh, at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And um, my paper fits into a, a larger project, but I'll talk about that uh, at some point. And I'm Melissa Burns. I am Associate Professor of History at Southwestern University here in Central Texas. Um, I'm in Austin right now. Um, and I'm a scholar of, of empire and migration, um, usually focused actually on North Africans, um, but today dipping into to the Portuguese, but always interested in questions of rights and activism. I'm Rosamond Hooper Hammersley. I'm recently retired from New Jersey City University, where I was the Associate Professor in the Department of History and the Honors Program Coordinator my first book was on Madame de Pompadour, her cultural and political patronage, and my current book project deals with the role of memory in the Holocaust, and recent papers at the uh, Western Society for French History has dealt with that in a number of different ways, and sorry for the beeping horn, um, and so that's my current work. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Greg, Greg Burgess. I'm speaking to you from um, uh, midwinter down in... Uh, actually in the countryside outside Melbourne, um, right down the side. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still amazed at the technology that um, we, can, we can link up like this over, considering 200 years ago, it would take about three months to travel this, mm -hmm. this distance. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm currently, as, as my paper suggests, I'm currently working on uh, um, issues relating to, uh, well, uh, certainly uh, the constitution of the fourth republic coming out of uh, coming out of uh, liberation and vichy um, but uh, more specifically i'm i'm interested in this uh, the idea of how um, how uh, human rights were uh, were emerging at the time and i'm largely motivated in that project uh, where it will go I, I i really don't know it's just something new my uh, my uh, uh, published work to date has really been on issues of refugee rights in france um, through the uh, for, from from the revolution through to uh, well through to the modern day, the um, my latest book came, uh, was published late last year. Um, uh, so migration, refugees, and so on, and within that context, the uh, uh, conceptions conceptions of refugee rights and so on. And I've been really focused more on um, on institutionalized ideas of rights and how politics and in institutional institutions and uh, polit uh, politics institutions and uh, and ideals and idealism clash. Uh, and that's really led me into looking more specifically at um, how, uh, how uh, quite surprised, I was quite surprised to see just, uh, just from general reading how, um, how uh, during the war years, uh, during the period of occupation in France, there were so many different attempts to define um, a new um, charter of human rights, um, even in America at the time, apart from uh, Roosevelt's Four Freedoms and so on, there were various documents floating around. So that's where I'm looking at the moment, how, how the, where these ideas come from um, and how they were shaped. And I really want to correct what I see as a major flaw in uh, post-war history that see human rights as, uh, as really something that came after the war and related uh, was seen as relating more to uh, Cold War ideology, um, the ideological conflict between uh, uh, the West and, and the East. Um, I see it as much more, uh, much deeper and more nuanced than, uh, than that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Greg. And thank you to all of you for, for including me in this discussion. Um, my, I'm, all the papers were so interesting to me and connected to my own work in, in such fascinating ways. Um, what I was, I, Greg has actually started us off um, kind of in a direction that I had hoped we could go in a bit to start. Um, the panel uh, has the phrase rights issues um, in the title. Um, and, 
And the concept of rights seemed to play out in interesting and different ways across the different papers. Um, so I was hoping that, that everyone um, maybe, and, and Greg has kind of started this process for it, um, that everyone could say a bit about uh, how the work that they've presented fits into broader projects for them. And, and maybe say a, a bit as well, um, and this might be something that um, could help us kind of start a conversation about how the papers relate to one another, um, but about how you situate your work vis-a-vis uh, -vis the concept of rights. So if you're working on human rights or if they're kind of political rights, economic rights, social rights, um, how the people that you are, are writing about, you know, is that a category for the actors that you're writing about? Is that an analytical category that's, that's important to you? Um, you don't all need to do that, uh, but I thought it might be a way to start drawing out some connections. Um, more generally, you know, I'm just interested in where these papers fit into bigger projects. We, we could go in the same order um, that, we, that we began in, um, if, if Michael wants to, to kick sure. us off. Sure, I, I have this project. I've written a lot about work and resistance to work. Uh, my first book's about, uh, it's called Workers Against Work kind of, uh, I don't know, you might say, uh, an anarchist classic, at least in certain uh, small circles, although uh, I, it wasn't very popular when it came out in 1990 amongst uh, uh, some of the most important uh, uh, historians of France. Therefore, I ended up in Wilmington, North Carolina, but that's a long story. But at, at any rate, I have this new project, which is actually about the denial of rights. And the, what I called the return of slavery or neo-slavery, right? neo-esclavitude in, uh, in Spanish, uh, that begins in 1914 and ends in 1945. And to me, this is a very interesting phenomena because what you have is the 19th century, generally speaking, is a century of abolition. And the 20th century in this period of the two world wars is the century or at least the period of the restoration of slavery. So that kind of connects with uh, people's concerns about uh, rights. This is kind of denial of rights, right? Mm -hmm. Thus the problem of forced labor, what we see and the return of slavery. I mean, the mm -hmm. two are, are distinct, but they're related to each other. That is mm -hmm. uh, slavery and forced labor. And just to make it quick, my first chapter is about uh, uh, the Ottoman uh, genocide of the Armenians and, and the enslavement, particularly of women. You know, some Utah uh, is, and that really is a traditional form of slavery in the Islamic world that uh, people don't like to talk about. But it's certainly a very powerful current, you know, throughout uh, the history of uh, that civilization. Uh, mm -hmm. My next chapter concerns uh, the Soviet Union, which is, uh, brings back its own forms of servitude, forced labor, and slavery. Then I want to deal a bit with uh, uh, fascist Italy, although that's a kind of more mild form, but it's certainly there when you think about uh, Mussolini and those pictures of him working in the field and, and and uh, uh, sowing uh, uh, grain and this sort of thing. It's very unusual. He's the only leader of the 20th century that I'm aware of, at least, you know, fairly major, that's out there in the field. You know, Hitler and, and uh, uh, the other uh, fascists were, didn't really pose in that manner. Um, and then uh, I do want to talk about Spain, the Spanish Civil War, where both sides, both the Republicans and the Nationalists, have their own labor camp. And then, of course, my chapter about France. And then I want to uh, end it, it's obviously quite ambitious, with a chapter concerning the Western Allies and how that's a new form of neo-abolitionism. So that's kind of the project here, as I say, and you know, I've, it's a long-term project. It may be my last book, who knows? Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. Uh, yeah. I think I spoke uh, enough. That's fine, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Melissa? Yeah, so, um, so this is one of those weird left turns for me. So um, people who've seen me present before, I'm usually talking about North African migrants. Um, that, that's sort of the big book project, but it was, you know, in the Ar municipal archives of San Denis, at one point I found this folder um, on this movement for amnesty in Portugal, and there were lots of very sort of similar themes, and I've been kind of digging into those over the years. Um, when I get bored of working on the book, I come back to, um, to, to these little pockets of anti-Salazar activism in France and sort of the ways that um, 
that that um, that has some interesting resonance with, with some of the anti-imperial movements that we see in France. Um, and I think in terms of sort of how rights fits into all of this, one of the, the real key questions I'm interested in, it's kind of the reigning question of the book project on, on local um, activism for, for North Africans, um, but it's a sort of question of, of why people choose to advocate for the human rights of others, right? That, that, and it's a very weird kind of thing. And um, I think this particular paper points to some of the potential pitfalls, right? There, there's all kinds of room for paternalism. There's all sorts of room for trying to, you know, assume the voice of someone else or, or sort of in some way capitalize on someone else's vulnerability. But then there's also this sort of more humanitarian, for lack of a better word at the moment, right? Um, desire to try to sort of advocate for others, in particular for, for me, right? I'm interested in why people step towards migrant populations. You know, what is it what, what are sort of the worldviews? What are the, the experiences that make us see the common humanity at a time, you know, mid 20th century when, when there's this real strong insistence on nationalism, national borders, um, citizenship, all of those things are vested with quite a lot of meaning and power. Um, and so those, those moments where people actually step away from those things and say, you know, for, forget what your citizenship is. I think we need to like figure out how you can lead a, a fuller and, um, you know, sort of more, um, more fulfilling life where you are. Um, I think that's a nice segue to, to Razi, um, as you were talking about kind of, um, you know, um, advocating for others. I was thinking about the final passage in her paper um, about secondary witnessing um, and bearing witness for witnesses and so on and so. Um, great, thank you. Um, I will start maybe at the end of what I ultimately want to say, which is that one of the roadblocks I, I ran into with this particular paper was copyright restrictions. And you don't usually have them for producing a paper. I had a, an H France recorded in a salon in um, San Antonio in 2015 or something. But because the screen was behind me, it wasn't an issue. I'm here and the screen's there and that's all fine. So five days before our my recording, um, I had to get a bunch of uh, permissions. So I fired up all these emails and then David sent me to Wikipedia Common, et cetera. And I heard from a friend of Kitty Hartmox and one of the two survivors uh, about whom I wrote on Tuesday, the day before. And I thought it was a school uh, that had recorded this interview. And there was a gazillion websites and all these different images, right? But it was a, the Masorti Synagogue at St. Albans. And they said, oh, this woman who was a community organizer said, Kitty Hart Moxon and her family would love to have you use the image and anything from the interview. And they're moved by anyone who is um, interest, interested or willing to tell her story. And they said, this is not for approval, but would you mind, would you mind sending us your paper and your PowerPoint? We would love to see it. And my husband said, how old is she? And I said, 93. And he said, yeah, you want to send that now. So I did, and I was so moved by that. And um, Melissa, you talked about left turns. And my uh, graduate uh, doctoral work was all in 18th century French culture history. I studied with a wonderful professor. I often joke, Warren Roberts, if he taught about Chinese history, my dissertation would have been about the Ming Dynasty. He was that good. And so it was my teaching in one of the courses I taught that ultimately led me into the 20th century. And a lot of my early work at the WSFH was on the French resistance, and I worked on Madeleine Marie Foucault and her um, cell, and then Lucio Bach, and eventually that led me into the matter of the verifiability, as scholars, prickly scholars, like to say, in terms of memory. And so each paper is sort of evolved. And then in Portland, I gave a paper on um, Charlotte Delbeau, primarily, and others, um, continue to deal with this. And so the book project will certainly deal with all of those topics, but it will also deal with uh, matters of survivor guilt and uh, matters of Holocaust denial. And so, Emma, when you talk, or when all of us, when we talk about rights, the right to be able to tell the story and not have it be questions. I can't imagine sitting in front of anybody, Ellie Wiesel or the least known person, and having them tell me whatever they're telling me and then saying, oh, really? And, you know, and what, what, you know, what evidence do you have? As historians, we work off evidence, but you don't have that kind of evidence if you were part of the Maquis or you worked in the resistance. 
or you survived whatever camp, labor or concentration or killing camp, which isn't to say that you don't need to step back and sort of look at it objectively to the degree that you can. But as you said, Emma, and as I conclude the paper, and particularly as I frame this paper in terms of the rising ultranationalism and uh, anti-Semitism, I think it is ever more important to be able to wait, to find ways to allow these stories to get out and to frame them in ways that doesn't step all over them. I have on either side of my screen their names so that I can remember when I was recording this paper, it wasn't about me, it wasn't about how I presented, it was their story, it was their message. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Um, oh dear, um, there's, there's 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 a lot there to uh, there's a lot there there to take in, but to really to uh, relate my uh, my, uh, my my specific word uh, work um, uh, to the themes. Um, I really, I mean, the the answer there for me is uh, for what Michael said about the denial of rights, um, the stepping off point for the material I've been uh, uh, reading. Um, is the reaction to that? That um, um, and I'm, I'm thinking of uh, um, uh, the way Hannah Arendt has uh, mm -hmm. has analysed the rise of totalitarianism. It's not simply the denial of rights, but it's denial, the, the denial of humanity, um, which uh, le uh, which uh, uh, led to all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, atrocities. Um, and so, therefore, the reaction against that. Um, is uh, what I'm seeing um, uh, reproduced in these attempts, oh, really from the late 1930s onwards, uh, through to uh, through to 45, and ultimately, if you want to take it that far, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, a reassertion of liberal values. Um, as uh, putting humanity back into the centre of um, uh, political, social uh, thinking, humanitarian law starts to formulate around that idea of uh, um, what it, what is human and what laws uh, relate to the protection of uh, of a person's humanity. Uh, and so um, when I'm thinking about um, the way that the, uh, the French um, uh, provisional government of uh, 44, 45, 46 um, started to uh, talk about um, introducing uh, social and economic rights into a charter of rights, um, that's, uh, that's really an attempt to yeah, really... Uh, well, they use the phrase over and over again, um, which we can basically summarise as human dignity. Um, and uh, what, do, what does liberty mean if, uh, well, what does equality mean if uh, your financial uh, circumstances make it impossible for you to seek redress through the law courts? Uh, what does uh, liberty and equality mean if you uh, can't um, afford um, to send your child to get a good education? Uh, those very, very, very basic things of uh, the status of the human being within uh, within society uh, around which um, uh, and, and if they are not <clears throat> if they are not recognized and implemented in any any sort of uh, uh, substantive substantive way then civil and political rights you know like very principles of liberty and equality are, are really rendered meaningless I mean that's really the that's really the major themes coming through in these these debates and you could really trace it back and this, uh, this uh, these are all responses to the the denial of rights um, that um, becomes evident during the uh, the rise of totalitarianism in the 1930s um, and the corrective that comes after that is the rest if liberalism is to re retain its values it's to get back to that very um, very central idea of well what is freedom what is equality and really um, one of the other themes that comes through in the, the material I'm reading presently is that the um, all the and I, I mentioned this in my paper all these allusions back to 1789 um, that um, uh, and uh, I did a paper recently uh, down here for a, a conference we had uh, here um, July last year uh, called Remembering Rights and um, 
uh, the theme I was following through there in all of these uh, at various attempts to uh, define a new charter of rights from the 30s through to uh, the, the late 40s. Um, there are always these, uh, from very specific rewriting of the preamble to the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen in 1789, uh, it's the contempt and the ignorance of rights that leads to the you know, the abuses of government and so on. Um, uh, that's restated or reworded in all sorts of ways. So the, uh, um, basically what I'm saying here is that my, my, my understanding of this is that the, uh, the advocates of, uh, of new uh, charters of rights and so on are actually grounding their, grounding their logic in the evolution of liberalism from the foundations of liberalism in uh, America in 1776, France in 1789, and, and, and so on. And that starts to inform post-war liberalism um, in, uh, in Europe, uh, particularly um, where it had come under most, well, where it was destroyed during the, uh, the, Nazi, the Nazi period. Um. If I could, if I could maybe jump in with a, another question, um, yeah. and this needn't be something that you know that everyone answers, um, but uh, but I wondered if anyone, uh, you know, I mean, one thing that I, I noted is we were all just you were all just going around talking about your papers, and one thing that I think is exciting about the framing of rights um, is that it allows you all to talk about politics. Um, while using a language, you know, that is about values, I heard ideals, ethics, um, you know, humanity, human dignity a lot. Um, and, um, and tr traditionally what we think of as French political history kind of drops out of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not talking about you know, the post-war party landscape and so on. Um, so I wondered if, if any of you wanted to, to talk about that a little bit about the ways in which um, these these values, these rights concepts, you know, that you are interested in, are being mobilized by different political actors, or how what how you see what you're doing intersecting with, you know, political history as as it's maybe more traditionally understood um, in the field. Um, it sounds as if it, mm. it sounds as if I see Rosie raising her hand. <laughs> um. In the beginning of my paper, when I cited the examples of various things in the last three years, in terms of, in the, within the context and the subject matter of my paper, uh, anti-Semitism, it was just, I think, four or five days ago, this will be overtly political, please forgive me, when the Trump campaign was using Nazi imagery, the triangle, and didn't even understand and then gone on to whatever was the Anti-Defamation League website, as if you needed to do that, to know that you shouldn't do that. And it, it, I thought, well, now, if that had happened six days ago, I would have included that in my paper. And so for me, the threat is everywhere in terms of people's rights, your political rights, your, your rights to health insurance and all these other things. And so, um, I don't know if it's right or wrong for me to think that what I endeavor to do in terms of this work is to protect or to underscore or ensure that these are things that should be. And here are the threats that are all around us all, all the time. And, and, as, and there are a handful of examples that I've given. And it's, and it's true in every respect. And Michael, you, you talked about it at the end of the war in 1946 and how long it took for them to think, oh, this should be in there, the Declaration of Rights. I'm um, sorry, um, that, uh, can you just explain that business of Trump and the Triangle? It's something that I haven't heard, heard reported down here. They were, they, they were using this imagery um, on campaign literature. Oh, yeah. And, and un unaware that the Triangle and all these, all these different um, symbolic distinctions, which either uh, defined you as a, an, in a concentration or a killing camp as homosexual, uh, or as uh, Roma, or or whatever category in which you felt, and so they were yeah. using it. I I I really hate using yeah. buzzwords. Yeah. Forgive me, but appropriating this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And by the way, for shame. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading. I was reading an article. I think it might have been from a journalist in the the Atlantic, 
uh, or maybe Huffington Post, um, uh, that uh, the speech he gave in uh, in Tulsa, uh, he was reading it. Uh, um, the the an an analysis was looking, picking through memes. I think is the buzzword used in uh, used over the internet now. That a lot of the uh, a lot of the language that he was using, or the illusions he was making, um, uh, could be found in the uh, protocols of the elders of Zion, for example, and being picked out of that. Uh, without really knowing where they came from and what their implications were. So you know, one has to wonder about his speech writers too and where they're do, whether they're doing their know. research. I Sorry, what's it? You know, but you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah mean, you're suppose, right. And, oh. sorry, sorry, go on, go on, Emma. No, I mean, I just, I suppose I was thinking about, you know, it's, it's, I'm interested that the conversation took this turn because I was thinking yeah. about kind of the, you know, in Melissa's case, the context of, of like France in the 1960s, right? Um, and in Michael's case, um, uh, France in the immediate post-war period um, and thinking about, you know, for example, um, were there specific political parties, political actors for, uh, you know, who wanted to mobilize the, a particular memory regime about what had happened during the war, um, yeah. a particular language of slavery, yeah. um, you know, I, and then in Melissa's case, um, I was, I was curious about the non-communist left versus communist student politics around you know, Iberia in general, really. I mean, so, um, so I'm, I'm, I love that the conversation moved to kind of politics right now. I think that's entirely appropriate. Yeah. Um, I just, I'm just interested in how the questions go on here. Yeah, well, um, I, could, I could deal with this very briefly from my point of view in the constitution making. Um, yeah. the, uh, the debates on the constitution, because the, uh, the communists and the socialists were the dominant parties in the uh, constituent assemblies, they were driving the debates on the, uh, on the, on the, on the rights idea. And the opposition that they face wasn't really from an extreme right has basically disappeared sure. by now, but there's this moderate Christian democratic right, the Mouvement Republican Populaire, uh, center right, I suppose we call it now, the Gaullist, um, precursors of the Gaullists, uh, but are very much uh, rooted in Catholicism and, and so on. That's really the center of the, uh, the opposition, but it wasn't opposition to um, the, uh, well, it was, it was you know, it was they were kind of playing devil's advocate, uh, really, in the debates. Um, that uh, and they 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 were mainly hanging on to the idea of uh, collective rights, family, community, um, and at the end of it, the church. Um, and they had to be very careful in how they voiced that because you see that these are some of the mottos of, of the of the Vichy period, family, travail, um, uh, and so and the importance of the church in, in the Vichy period. So they had to be very careful in how they voice that um, but they supported the idea you know they were center right they had um, ideas of liberalism and so on that they wanted to support but the main drive was coming from the left um, the role of the the center and the the right was to moderate that. and ultimately the defeat of the first constitution was that the constitution was uh, a unicameral one the, the communists were putting forward the idea of basically that the parliament a more a most a, uh, the most democratic form of political representation would be what the uh, the, cons um, the national convention was in 73, 18, uh, 1793, sorry, 1793, 1794, where um, elect your representatives, your representatives are, are representing you, there is no executive, it's the, uh, the representatives are the executive and so on. And that's the way that the, constitu the first constitution of 46 was framed. And that's really why it was defeated and the constitution that was passed went to a bicameral parliament with a chamber of deputies and a, uh, uh, I think they call it a Senate in um, uh, 40, uh, 46. Uh, but yeah, that's really how the politics in the context of my paper was, was playing out. I just want to say something about the language of slavery that, that you mentioned, Emma. Um, every group, that was the victim of either forced labor, slavery, uh, even extermination, engaged in uh, uh, what uh, the Europeans call a competition among victims. 
So you have these forced laborers in France, in terms of memory, who claim after the war they were victimized as much as people who were deported either for racial or for political reasons. So this becomes very controversial throughout. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yes, this is uh, part of, of the problem, right, this language issue. I think um, if I can sort of take on Emma's question a little too, I think one of the things that that sort of drew me into it, I sort of mentioned, right, like I, I fell into this sitting in Saint-Denis, which is, you know, as, as communist as you can get pretty much, although kind of in their own interesting way. Um, so um, th there, there's quite a lot, a lot of the, the movement for Portuguese amnesty and even among the student groups tends to be to be far left. And I think something that's really interesting in this moment, these are threads I need to pull a little more um, in, in this work. Um, I'm more familiar with it in sort of my, my work on North Africans, right? But but it's sort of, you know, we're looking at the end of the 60s, this is, or even throughout the 60s, right, this is the fracturing of the left, this is the moment where you have particularly student groups, right, are going in sort of more Maoist or other Gauchist directions, um, right. with this disillusionment from, from the Communist Party that actually stems from the, you know, sort of earlier support of empire and, and kind of experience of, of the Algerian war. And so that's one of the things that's interesting to me, and this is sort of the, the next piece from this, this set of projects, right, is looking specifically at the ways that a lot of this anti-Salazar activism actually starts drawing on um, anti-Algerian war rhetoric and, and strategy. Um, I think, you know, it, we've talked a bit, um, Razi was talking about the way that, that sort of the symbols and, and ideas are, are, are reused and reappropriated by, by those who are abusing rights, but those who are sort of being activists for rights also start to sort of pick up on these strategies and start to use similar forms. And so for me, right, one of the interesting things is that you have this, um, you know, this, this use of anti-fascism, a pretty easy case, right, for Salazar, but that was exactly what they said um, you know, the, the, the left's argument against the Algerian war is that it was fascist, right? And that, that it was, a, that the imperialism itself was fascist, that the OAS was fascist, right? So this is, there's this anti-fascist theme that comes through. And one of the things you see is that as um, these anti-Salazar activists are, are getting more involved, they're pulling the calling back, right? They're saying, you know, Salazar is not just fascist or the, you know, the, the regime is not just fascist in Portugal, it's also fascist in its imperial holdings. Um, there's that fascinating quote by, by Bloor saying, you know, because we survived the Algerian war, we have true democracy and now we know what this means. I have all kinds of questions about exactly um, how that plays out, but, you know, he's making that connection between sort of colonial things and that's, I don't know sort of how we're doing on time, but I think one of the things I was I was hungry for, um, particularly uh, reading Michael and Greg's papers, right, is sort of where where is the empire in this in terms of forced mm. labor, in terms of economic rights, and even other rights. And I think even even with with Razi's work, I was sort of thinking, you know, kind of a different sort of question, right? But how do we how do we handle the memories of these colonial atrocities and some of these stories that are coming out, right? Isn't that um, you know what kinds of obligations do we have in that? So, I don't know. That's that's sort of my question. Um, because, you know, back to Emma's question, right, because I see the political spectrum that, that um, my activists are working in, um, in this sort of anti-Salazar 60s movement, it's very sort of conditioned by, by a lot of these experiences of anti-imperialism as well. Hmm. Emma, so. may I add one thing? Um, I was, in terms of um, current day politics, and as I'm framing this particular work, and I think about all of these strains, um, it is so current because of the threat that is right there in front of us. And I was just thinking about, I think it was a couple of days ago where another cemetery, Jewish cemetery in Tennessee, I think was desecrated. And so it is in that spirit that I'm talking about these things because it is so very pressing. Is it possible to ask questions of each other in terms of your work? I just did. <laughs> yeah. May I ask Melissa a question? I, uh, I was curious, Melissa, if there are, um, additional voices from which you draw uh, in, in terms of these French students. You talk about Jean Claro and Humberto Lucas. Are there others? I don't know if there was a correspondence network, um, other ways in which you can um, glean from what they were endeavoring to do, what worked, what didn't work. Yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. N no, not too much. I have um, 
that, that there's some sort of the broader like UNEF and UGA stuff. Um, and then um, weirdly, a lot of the French diplomatic archives have been, tra we're tracking a lot of the student movements. And so um, them and, and a little bit from the Paris police, but not too much. I think the ideal thing, and that's, that's I think beyond my uh, linguistic and current travel abilities, the ideal thing would be to go check the, um, Portuguese, the PETA archives, right? The, the Portuguese secret police, I'm sure, would have fantastic wow. um, amounts of information for all sorts of terrible human reasons. Um, one of those of us who deal with police archives, right, always sort of wrestle with this, that, that you get great information from a regime doing things that you really, really don't want to support. But right. um, yeah. I'd love to give some space to, to Melissa's question. I think we can probably take about five more minutes. Um, and this was next on my list too, um, kind yeah. of what happens to imperial framings, uh, you know, mm -hmm. when we move more towards I feel like the, 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 you know, many of the papers are doing kind of exciting things in terms of transnational thinking about rights violations and so on. Um, but, uh, but there are ways in which um, uh, empire crops up, even though problems aren't being framed in terms of empire. And this is particularly interesting to me in, in Greg's paper. I mean, that, that one of the, um, real stumbling blocks that they come upon um, in in defining rights is that the citizenship is is not being accorded, you know, to, to members of the French Union, and so it's actually a problem about defining yeah. belonging within an imperial yeah. space that yeah. trips up the whole rights project. Um, and there, there. Um, so, uh, Melissa posed the question already, so I'll. I'll be quiet um, and let you use the time, but I'm really glad that she raised yeah. that. Yeah, well, uh, just, just on that, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, Empire shows is uh, uh, the hypocrisy of a lot of, uh, a lot of the great ideals that um, the French Republic um, uh, promotes. Um, uh, so, for example, I'm just, I just can't think of, I don't have the text in front of me, uh, and I just can't remember the articles, um, but in the, um, in the preamble to the um, uh, Constitution of October 46, the, uh, the Constitution of the Fourth Republic, there are a couple of articles on, uh, that specifically relate to the rights of uh, uh, people from uh, the, uh, La Union Française, as they, they re re rename it, the, the Empire. Um, which was rendered completely, they, they were completely abandoned when it came to uh, the restoration of French authority in, uh, in Vietnam, for example, in, uh, in 45, and then everything that happens in, uh, in North Africa and Algeria, especially afterwards. Um, uh, and so, you know, my best contribution to that would be that old imperialism survives, um, you know, French, French glory and, and all that. Um, uh, uh, and you know the great ideals of rights and so on and and if you, you go back through the history of rights through the 19th century all the way back to the revolution you know the terror is the best example of it um that the same one thing contradicting them by political actions on, on the other um the uh the the interesting part for historians is, is trying to assess how they can rationalize the two which is what makes the terror such an interesting uh, fascinating aspect of the study of the French Revolution that uh, they're maintaining that they're upholding the principles while doing these, you know, you know executing so many thousands of people. Similar sorts of uh, uh, the way I see uh, the way I see empire and rights in uh, in the 1940s into the decolonization phase uh, is pre precisely something like that. Um, trying to maintain the the integrity of uh, of uh, 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 France as one and indivisible. Um, and in order to do that, as they would, they would, they would justify themselves as saying, we're upholding the principles of, of the Republic, etc., which means that anyone who's acting against the interests of the, of the, of the Republic by, uh, promoting, um, colonial independence, for example, is, you know, breaking up, uh, breaking up the empire, breaking up France and therefore, um, need, need to be suppressed. Um, um that, that, that's how I would answer that. Thank you. Um, we have maybe about three minutes left. I just want to make sure I didn't know if Michael wanted to, to respond to that question as well. 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. And uh, uh, in terms of slavery and forced labor, empire is, uh, uh, has a very mixed response. Right. The empire in the period that I'm studying, uh, uh, pretty much, uh, at least the continental countries, uh, is an attempt uh, uh, by the French or the Germans or the Soviets to reimpose slavery and forced labor. Um, but, and the Italians too, for that matter. But for instance, as I mentioned, if you take a look at the British, the British, of course, were the first country to abolish slavery, and they imposed that abolition throughout their empire and other empires too, that matter. So in terms of looking at slavery and forced labor, one has a hard time generalizing about empire per se. Oh, sure. Right. Mm. I think just just one thing I'd, I'd maybe throw out that you know, g given some current conversations that are going on in, in our world, I think, in terms of you know thinking about abolition and in terms of thinking of you know fundamental critiques of 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 the liberal platform through imperialism, right? I, I, I think Haiti, right, needs to to be thrown in there, right? The, the 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 first main group to abolish slavery, but also to also to say, hey, there there's some hypocrisy in the way the French are holding up empire. I think I think mm. that that has to go to the Haitians, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Although the French are the first major country to abolish slavery, right? 1794, right? Mm. So that, that helps to spark the Haitian revolt, although it's also obviously a response to the Haitian revolt. But abolition, at least in its origins, is essentially Western civilization, in my opinion, either the Enlightenment or evangelical Protestants. You don't find it, and this is my point about the Ottoman Empire, you don't find it in the Islamic world or much of uh, the, the non-Islamic African continent. This is a Western phenomenon these days of critique of Western civilization. Right. If you read the historians of, uh, of slavery and abolition, and there are many excellent ones. Um, would anyone um, like to, to throw in a last word? Um, anything that you feel we didn't get to because we have, we've reached 40 minutes so quickly, um, but I, I, um, I think that um, otherwise, anybody raising a hand? Um, I think I'm going to cut us off um, so that we remain within our time limits. Um, thank you, Emma. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank so you. Much for thank everybody. Um, this was a lot of fun. Uh, so um, everyone take care and thank Good. you again. Thanks, Emma. Thanks all.